Hi there, this is Chris, Chapman Account Motor Legends. Going to talk to you today about the kind of gear you need for winter commuting. We're not gonna be talking about the five or 10 minute commute, we're gonna be talking about the gear you need if you're going to be doing a proper high mileage commute. Now, this video is not aimed at people who have been doing this for years, but what's happened is during the pandemic, we've come across a lot of people, a lot of people have passed through, through the shop who have decided to undertake a proper commute. And I'm talking about an hour long commute, and I'm not sure that they are always prepared for what they're going to find. So what I think I would say is that if you're someone who's been commuting for years, if you've done this forever, then today's video might not be of particular interest. But if this is something new to you, then I think you need to watch this because you are undertaking something that is pretty hazardous and can be very uncomfortable. You need to have the right gear. You need to know what they're doing. So I'm hoping that at the end of this video, you'll have a little bit more of an idea about what you need. For many people, a motorcycle represents the best way of getting into work. Some people do it for the sheer pleasure of being out on two wheels. For some, it's about finding a means that is quicker and cheaper than the alternatives. Those alternatives might be obviously a car, a train or a bus. If there's nowhere to park near where you work or the nearest railway station is a mile away, a motorcycle might just be more convenient. Of course, the pandemic has also caused a lot of people to take up motorcycling as a way of getting into work because it allows them to be more socially distanced than you can be if you were to take, for example, the train. Now, in nice weather, who wouldn't like to ride into work on their bike? It makes the boring slog of getting into work a whole lot of fun. But in the winter, I can assure you, it's an entirely different kettle of fish. It can be horrid and miserable. And if you're not properly equipped and properly prepared, you're going to be a danger to yourself and by implication, other road users. If you're shivering cold on the bike, you simply won't be comfortable and you won't be able to concentrate on the task in hand. You won't be able to give 100% of your attention to, to your riding. You are in effect an accident in the waiting. Now, add to the cold and getting wet and that's going to make the situation even worse because the wind chill factor is going to cause your temperature to drop even further you're going to become even more uncomfortable and if it's raining of course the obstacle course that you are negotiating that is the traffic becomes even tougher and more dangerous and don't forget also in the winter when you're commuting in early in the morning or coming home in the evening it's also going to be dark so you take a combination of the cold the wet and the dark and you have a pretty dangerous set of circumstances and we don't care how much you love motorcycling that's not going to be fun in fact it's going to be far from it and in those circumstances you need help and you need help in the form of the right gear so often when people talk about safety and being protected on the bike conversation tends to turn to the quality of your protectors and about the abrasion resistance and the slide times of the materials that form the clothing you're wearing. Now, here at Motor Legends, we favor a slightly different scenario. We're trying to create a situation where we put you in a position where you're less likely to have an accident in the first place. After all, it's always possible to find more protective gear. That gear may not be as comfortable to wear, but you can always find more protective gear. So for example, here we might put you into an off-road back protector. How about a heavy duty leather suit? How about a pair of off-road boots? And perhaps even an airbag vest. Wear gear like this, and I can assure you that if you fall off, you'll stand a much better chance of bouncing. But our view is that in the right gear, we can make that parting company with the bike far less likely. Now for us, the key consideration or the key word is comfort. I'm not talking about the kind of comfort you get from wearing a sheepskin jacket or a pair of slippers. Our aim is to put you in a situation where you are totally relaxed and comfortable on the bike, where your helmet is not causing pain, where there's no steaming up of the visor, where your ears are not assailed by noise. You've got total mobility on the bike, so if something happens, you can react quickly. Where your body temperature is as close to room temperature as it can be, you're not feeling too cold, you're not feeling too hot. A situation where you can feel your fingers on the bike, where your, your finger ends haven't gone numb, where the rain isn't running down the sleeves into your gloves or down your trousers into your boots. If we can help you achieve this condition, we think you've got a much better chance of spotting that guy who turns right out of the junction ahead, or the white van man who decides to overtake without indicating, or the lady who does a U-turn because at the last minute she realises there's a shortcut. There's commuting and there's commuting. Now, if you're travelling more than an hour into work every day, we reckon you just need to suck it up and take some of that money that you're saving by commuting on a motorbike and invest it 
in some high quality gear because you are going to need it. If by contrast you've got a commute of maybe 30 to 45 minutes, then you can go to a slightly lower grade of gear because frankly you're just not going to get as cold, you're not going to get as wet. Recently we had a chap here in the shop, came in to talk about his winter commuting requirements. As part of that conversation, it came out that he had a four kilometer commute. Somewhat tongue in cheek, we recommended to him go buy a bicycle. But actually today I want to talk about serious long distance commuting. I'm talking about the kind of commuting that's going to see you doing at least 10, probably 15, even 20,000 miles a year. We're talking about a commute of 25 miles either way, of which part I'm imagining is going to be in heavy traffic. We're going to talk about what you might need for what we are terming extreme motorcycling. If you've got a shorter commute, you're just not going to need everything that we're going to be talking about today. We are in essence putting together a packing list for climbing Everest. If all you're doing is walking up Ben Nevis, then you're not going to need everything we're talking about. Let's talk first about the suit because that's probably where you're going to invest most of your cash. It's probably where you should invest most of your cash. Now, if you're commuting more than 45 minutes into work and back home, we reckon almost certainly that you need to go laminate. I'm going to come back and address that a little bit later. The truth is that any suit, be it a drop liner suit or a laminate suit, should keep you dry for your commute. If it's a 45 minute commute, an hour's commute, even a 90 minute commute, a decent waterproof jacket and pants should not allow water in. But actually, the benefit of a laminate is not about staying dry per se, it's not about water reaching the body, it's about its effect on helping you stay warm on the bike. Now, a laminate suit, because you've got the membrane bonded to the inside of the fabric, doesn't allow water to pass into it. So a laminate suit doesn't hold water. Now, when you're riding along at zero degrees, the more water there is being held by your suit, the colder you're gonna get because heat conducts itself far faster through a wet medium. The other thing about a laminate suit is it dries out much faster. So if you've ridden into work, it's taken an hour to get in, it's rained the whole time, you're going to have a wet jacket. If it's a drop liner jacket, you may well find yourself going home at five o'clock and putting on a wetsuit. And again, that's not nice, it's not comfortable, it's going to allow heat to escape from the body and so on, and the wind chill factor is going to make you feel very cold. So putting on a dry jacket in the evening is going to make the return journey much nicer, and obviously that's another reason for going laminate. Now, let's just talk about laminate suits because there are lots of them out there. The more expensive laminate suits are by and large better built. They're going to last longer and they tend to come with longer warranties. So we've got suits with five year warranties, six year warranties, even 10 year warranties. There's a suit that came out earlier this, this year. It's an amazing suit, it's from Risha. It's called the Infinity 2 Pro. It's 500 pounds top and bottom. But what you need to know is if you are undertaking a commute of the sort that I'm talking about today, it is not a Rucker, it is not a Stadler, it is not a Helvarsons, it's not a Klim. To a degree, you do get what you pay for. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of this little segment about there being an alternative or an option to laminate, and there is. What, it's what we call the thinking man's laminate. And what you do, you take a as good a quality drop liner jacket or pants as you possibly can, and then for commuting, you wear a waterproof over the top. What you need to understand is even though in this country in particular we obsess about the rain and it is not nice commuting in the rain, it does not rain every day. And by and large, when it doesn't rain, a drop liner is gonna be more comfortable, it's gonna be more cosseting, it's gonna be nicer to wear, it's also gonna be warmer for various reasons. The problem with having to put a waterproof on over your drop liner garments is that you need to make the decision when you leave the house in the morning or before you get on the bike to come home in the evening because nobody wants to stop midway through a, a commute. So there's a bit more hassle involved, but the result is in some ways better. A drop liner suit with a waterproof over the top is better than a laminate in that when you arrive at your destination, you take the waterproof off and the suit underneath is gonna be bone dry. Now, even with the world's best laminate suit, you don't get that because a laminate suit is, whilst it's not gonna get heavy and wet, it's not gonna really absorb the water, it's still gonna be damp. So you'll arrive at work or at home with a damp suit. With a waterproof over a drop liner, you won't at all. If you're gonna go down that route, in our view, it's very simple, you've gotta go for the Scots. They are the best waterproofs, they are the most breathable, they're very stretchy, they're very comfortable, and they're very long-lasting. From our perspective, there just isn't an alternative. 
going to give you one last little tip. If you are doing this kind of commute, the kind of 10, 15, 20,000 miles a year, the more miles you do, the more frequently you need to wash the suit. Because every suit requires um, or relies upon what we call the durable water repellent, that is a waterproof coating on the outside. When that wears off, water is going to soak in. Less so on a laminate, more so on a drop liner, but the effect is the same. More water is going to be taken on board. You need to refresh that durable water repellent as frequently as you can. We would think at least every 5,000 miles. If you don't do that, it's just a matter of time before water seeps into the jacket and at some point it reaches the body. All the things that I've mentioned, I've focused as we often tend to do about the jacket. The same obviously applies to the trousers. In the last segment, my focus was on the kind of waterproof gear you needed to wear in order to stay dry during your commute. Staying dry with reference to how important that was in terms of staying warm on the bike because staying warm is really what it's about. If you are riding into work in the winter, it can be freezing cold, you're doing 70 miles an hour, the wind chill factor, it can just be unbearably cold. So you need to stay warm because otherwise you're a danger to yourself and other road users as we've often discussed in the past. The first thing you need to know is do not wear anything cotton. A cotton t-shirt as a base layer is just the wrong thing to do. Cotton doesn't breathe, it absorbs the moisture. So we're always sweating and what will happen with a cotton t-shirt, it'll develop those wet patches. It's not very comfortable and if the temperature drops further as you're riding along, that freezes or becomes very cold, it's just not the way to do it. What you want next to your skin is a technical base layer, something meshy, something in polyester. That will enable the mid layer that you wear over the top of the base layer to do its job far more effectively. Now, the mid layer is really the insulating layer, and there are lots of different forms of mid layer, lots of different technologies. So there's Outlast, there's Thinsula, there's Primaloft, there's Windstopper, there's Innerborn. There's no single best solution, and we all react differently to these various technologies. Some people, for example, if you don't generate in general, a lot of heat from your body. Some people just can't get on with Outlast. So whilst Outlast is fantastic in some applications, it does not work for everybody. We here at Motor Legends are particular fans of merino wool. It's light, it's soft, it's comfortable to wear. It holds a huge amount of moisture without you feeling wet. It breathes well, it stores heat in the fibers, and you can wear it for weeks on end and it doesn't tend to stink. Now, more recently, we've become convinced of the benefits of down filled jackets. The best one is probably this one from Rucker. It's 90% duck downs, 10% duck feathers. It takes no volume under the jacket, so you do not need a lot of room between your base layer and the jacket, but it is incredibly warm. It works even better, by the way, if you wear underneath it a very lightweight windproof layer. There's one from Klim, it's called the Klim Zephyr, but a combination of a base layer, a Klim Zephyr and that, and you're pretty much as good as you're going to get without going electric. Don't forget also, in terms of windproofing, you can also put the Scott on the outside. If it's a freezing cold day and you're still getting cold even though you're wearing all this gear, then put a waterproof on the outside because a waterproof membrane is also a windproof membrane. So even though it's not raining, you will warm your body temperature up significantly by just putting on a windproof over the top. So waterproof, not just for when it's raining. But there is ultimately a problem with any layering system because layers are basically insulating layers. And what they do, they keep heat that is generated by the body close to the body. Now that works fine if you are climbing a mountain at sub-zero temperatures because you're working hard, you're generating heat, you're using energy, and the layers can keep that heat in. But it works less well, or layers work less well, when you're doing nothing, you're sat on a motorbike at 70 miles an hour, to two degrees, you're not generating heat, there comes a point where the layers are not keeping heat in because you're not generating heat. You might be fine for 30 minutes on a really cold day, 45 minutes, some people even more. I mean, Sean here is young, fit and stupid. He rides from central London out to us every day. It's an hour. He reckons he's not riding long enough to get cold. But for most of us, that's not the case. There's going to come a point where base layers, mid layers are eventually not going to be doing the job for you. There comes a point in our view where only electric clothing is going to keep you warm. Now, we know that there are lots of people out there who just for whatever reason, whatever prejudice, will not consider electric. They are the same people, I suspect, who will only ever ride in leather, who wouldn't consider wearing a flip lid helmet, the kind of people who hate BMW motorcycles. I don't care, I don't know 
what your prejudices are, but it doesn't matter. Get over yourself. Electric gear is fantastic. The best heated gear is amazing. It's easy to use and wear. There's no complexity other than up here in your head. All you do, you put a harness on the battery. When it's cold, you plug it in. You'll have a lead here, you'll plug it in under the seat. If it's not cold, you don't plug it in. There's nothing complex about it. We are unashamed fans of the American brand Warm and Safe. We think it's the best gear. It's the lightest, it's the thinnest, thinnest, it's the warmest, it's the most reliable. You've got a Bluetooth controller that you affix to the bike somewhere so there's no wire between the controller and the jacket. It's so easy to use, it's, it's amazing. My point is this, and it's a point that I will keep coming back to and I've made before. If you're going to be safe on your commute, you've got to be comfortable. And you cannot be comfortable on your bike unless you're warm. Wear electric, try electric, and you'll be amazed at the difference it makes. Even on the coldest day, you will feel warm and toasty. If you're gonna be commuting through the winter, then our view is that electric will not just make your life more comfortable, ultimately, it could just save your life. Let's talk helmets and the kind of helmet you need for a winter commute. Firstly, obviously we're not gonna countenance an open face helmet. There are people who do commute in open face helmets, but in our view, that's somewhat a masochistic. In the winter, the issues are gonna be cold air ingress, it's gonna be noise and it's gonna be misting. Now for us, the solution is always gonna be a good quality flip lid. And when I say good quality flip lid, I suppose I'm talking about Shui or Shuba. You can get a cheap flip lid, but they just don't deliver the kind of benefits that a good quality flip lid does. Now, a good quality flip lid seals, and this is one of the secrets of a flip lid, seals better around the neck. Because of the way we put it on, it doesn't have to stretch over the wide part of the head, we kind of slide it on, it has a much tighter neck roll. So if we compared this with its sister helmet, this is the Neotech 2, if we compared it with the GT Air 2, that would have a much larger aperture there, and therefore that's gonna let more air in. So that air that is allowed to come in, when it reaches the ears, that clearly translates as noise. So a good quality flip lid like this is going to be quieter. It's also going to be warmer because when that cold air comes in, reaches the face and the head, that's gonna cool, cool you down. So a, a better sealed helmet is gonna be not just quieter, it's gonna be warmer. Provided of course that it's been properly and professionally fitted and fits the way it should. Now, the other issue that can be um, a problem if you're commuting is water ingress. It's not a problem on a helmet of this kind of quality, I wouldn't expect. We don't see water ingress as a problem on helmets very often these days. If there is, it's normally because the owner of the helmet has not replenished the rubber seal. In every helmet, you get a little bottle of, of oil and a, um, you use a cotton bud. You have to replenish and plump up the rubber seal. The only time we ever see water ingress is when someone hasn't done that. So there is, however, a problem with a flip lid, or there can be. And it's because, again, of this tighter neck roll. Because no air can come in or less air comes in, it's harder to expel air at the same time. Now, if you can't expel the warm air from your breath, you've got the cold air coming on, you're on the motorway, it's super cold, you're doing 60 miles an hour, the difference in temperatures can create condensation. And if the warm air can't escape, that is going to cloud up the helmet. So there are things that you need to do. You need to have the very best pin lock, 120 pin lock. All shoes come with 120, so that's not an issue. You also need to use the visors properly. So you're gonna to have to have the brow and the chin vent open. So this allows cold air to come in, which reduces the temperature differential. This one open means it's gonna drag it out. So you're always flowing the air through, keeps the air drier. I would say, by the way, that we have no issue with full face helmets. We just think that for this kind of riding, flip lids are gonna perform better. Now, you will need, and again, helmets like this, like the Schubert as well, you will need a form of protection against the sun. These have drop down sun visors. You're gonna need that, especially if part of your commute is gonna be going east in the morning or west in the evening. There are people out there who prefer or find a benefit in the peak of an adventure helmet. And those people, what they love is that you can just duck your head and it blocks out the sun completely. Now, personally, we've never found that an issue. We think the drop-down visor works, works fine, but if you want to peak, that's okay. You're just gonna to have to accept that there's a trade-off in terms of buffeting, because the problem with a, 
a peak is that if it conflicts with the screen on your bike, it can buff it around and it will add noise. But that's, that's a personal thing. The last thing that we would want to have in any helmets that we were riding for a winter commute, we would want to have it fitted with comms. Doesn't matter whether you like music, whether you tend not to take phone calls, obviously you're not going to be talking to anyone else normally in terms of another rider, but if there's an emergency and you need to get on to the blower quickly, then there's nothing better than having a comms fitted. What you don't want to have to do is to stop, search for your phone, take your helmet off and try to make a phone call with all that noise and so on going on around you. So for winter commute, we would also fit, always fit comms. In terms of extra warmth, because it's still possible that, that you might feel cold, that your head might, might get cold, you can always wear a balaclava, a thin silky balaclava tends to work fine. You can wear a neck warmer, some of the jackets that we've been, been talking about earlier on come as standard with a neck warmer, or you can buy an aftermarket one. Hal Varsons does an electric neck warmer. Obviously you wouldn't wear that if you had the warm and safe because the warm and safe actually has an electrically heated collar. Finally, in terms of the colour of helmet, the most popular colour for helmets these days is black, particularly matte black. That's not the colour that we would wear for commuting. We'd go for a light colour, a yellow, a white, whatever. Some people hold to the view that solid blocks of colour are better because as you turn your head you make yourself more visible to the guy at the junction who's looking right but can't see you. The other thing that you should do is delve into the box and the instructions that came with the helmet. Every helmet comes with a set of stickers. In fact, these stickers are legally required on the continent. A lot of people never find them because of course they never look at the instruction manual. But you take those stickers, you put them on the back of the helmet, they shine up bright white if there are lights behind you. What you're wanting to do over the winter is edge everything in your favor and those little stickers might just do it. So if you're gonna commute on a bike through the winter, it's incredibly important that you find a way of keeping your hands warm because you cannot concentrate on the road if you can't feel your fingers. That burning sensation that you get when the blood flow stops at the end of your fingers is just debilitating. And so you need to do whatever it takes to make sure that you can feel your hands at all times. Now, the first thing that we would recommend is a set of heated grips. And there are none better than the rather ugly heated grips that are made by Oxford. I think they're about 80 pounds. They work far better than the gloves you get from people like BMW and Ducati. They've got 10 settings. They're incredibly warm. You'll actually burn your hands if you have them on the top settings. They are fantastic. Although what you have to understand is that they work better out of town than they do in town. As you're riding along on the motorway, your hands are around the grips. You're getting the full effect of the heat. When you get in town and you are on the levers more, the levers are metal, they're very cold, you're gonna get less of an effect from the heat heated grips. Don't forget also hand guards. Hand guards are very effective, again, at combating the wind chill. Again, they work better out of town than in, because in town you're gonna to be doing 20, 30 miles an hour. Out of town you might be doing 70. Bar muffs are another way to go. Personally, I'm not sure I'd want to ride a bike with bar muffs, but then again, I don't commute through the winter. I know they do a job. The couriers swear by them. Now, don't forget why your fingers get cold. They get cold because of the large amount of surface area that is facing the wind, as it were. There's a huge amount of skin here, not a lot of fat in the fingers. And when you're riding along at say two degrees at 70 miles an hour, that translates, that is perceived as a temperature of minus eight degrees. And frankly, that is bloody cold. And if you are riding along and all you can think about is how cold your fingers are, then you're not thinking about, for example, braking distances. Now, even if you've got heated grips and we think you absolutely have to have heated grips if you're going to commute through the winter, you are still going to need a decent pair of winter gloves. There's a huge choice out there and one of the major trade-offs is between feel and warmth because warmth is going to come from extra, normally come from extra insulation and the more insulation you have, the thicker the gloves going to be, the less feel you're going to have on the bar. So that's very much a personal decision. The warmest gloves technically are what we call two or three chamber gloves. That's gloves like these. Some people don't like them because frankly, they look a wee bit weird, but if you want warm hands, that's gotta be the way to go. And they work because again, when your fingers are in different compartments, there's less skin, there's less surface area facing the wind, but also your fingers are rubbing up against one another and they're making your fingers feel warm. When you're gonna buy a winter glove, go for a glove that's a wee bit large. Now, heated grips or not, you've got heat in your hands, 
what we're trying to do is keep some of that heat inside the glove and that works far better if there's a gap of air between the glove and the skin it just insulates it, keep, it keeps your hands warm. Another thing you can do is silk inners. Now silk inners um, very thin and what happens is as you're riding along they your hands rubbing against the silk inners they are generating heat they do certainly work they add an effect they're not going to change the nature of riding but they're certainly going to add a, a degree or two to, to your hands next thing to look at potentially is motorcycle gloves that are powered by a little battery now i've got to say we're not massive fans here over the years we've tried many different pairs most of them end up coming back with people who are disappointed about how ineffective they are on a short commute they will take the chill off the temperature but if you've got a longer commute and if the temperatures are cold enough then that little battery just cannot generate enough heat to keep your hands warm enough for long enough. We do however like gloves that are connected to the bike and that be that's because as with the jacket they are generating heat all of the time so they work well. Now what we have found however is that the gloves that are pure heated gloves you are heating the atmosphere outside the glove a lot and that's not particularly effective so we prefer in a way the gloves the solution that has been come up with by warm and safe and what these are it's like a silk liner it's a little bit thicker than a silk liner but they have heated elements that come up and down the fingers this is a fabulous way of keeping your hands warm there's an added benefit in that you can then wear the gloves you want. So if you've got a favorite pair of Halvarsson's gloves or Rucker gloves or whatever gloves, you can wear those. If you go for a heated glove from one of the heated companies, you end up wearing a glove that's made by someone who may understand electric elements and so on, but they don't necessarily understand protection and safety. So I think this is a great way to go. It is the warmest solution. And as I've said, it allows you to wear the gloves you want. The only thing that other thing I would mention is in terms of the gloves, normally in the winter we'd be wearing a glove, we prefer a glove that goes inside the cuff and the reason for that is that then the water as it runs down in the rain, runs down your hand, that won't go into the glove, it won't reach the fingers. There are some gloves out there that are designed to be worn outside the cuff rather than inside and that's fine what you do on a pair of gloves like this you've got a drawstring it pulls the cuff tight it pulls the, the gauntlet tight so the water can't get in I think at times some water can get in but if that's the kind of glove you want to wear then fine that's another way of doing it so that's it gloves incredibly important you don't want to get cold hands we feel our hands almost more than anything else on the bike in the cold so it's vitally important that you keep your hands warm so finally, this brings us to boots. Now, the truth is that we don't have a whole lot to say about boots. We want, or you want, your feet to stay warm and dry, but the options are far more limited than they are with, say, your trousers, your jacket, helmets, gloves, and so on. You're going to want, clearly, a taller boot. The problem with a shorter boot is that as you're riding along and it's raining, the water's going to hit the ground, it's going to bounce up. If you've got a short boot, it's going to come over the top of the shaft, it's going to reach the foot, you're going to end up with a wet foot, and a wet foot very quickly becomes a cold foot. But there's no such thing in our book as a winter boot, a winter boot per se. There are summer boots, and there are boots out there with perforations and boots with venting even. And clearly, if you're commuting over the winter, you want to avoid a boot like that. We particularly like the comfort liners in Daytonas, um, the same liners exist in held boots and we've seen them in TCX boots. It's just a nice, cosy way of putting a Gore-Tex liner in the boot. In the winter, you're going to need to wear a thicker sock. It's as simple as that. If you want warmer feet, you wear socks. What that means is that you're going to need a bigger size than you might normally take. Now, we have people here who just don't want to wear a larger boot than they would normally want in a, say, a walking boot. But for us, that doesn't make sense you're not walking about a lot in a motorcycle boot. It's just about getting into work and getting out of work. And if you have to take a larger boot to fit a thicker sock in, so be it. Only if your Valentino Rossi does that, fine. Fit of a boot really care. We're not looking for an extra tenth of a second going into work. So if you have to have a slightly larger boot, so be it. In terms of the socks, you're going to want a sock that's breathable. So you don't want a cotton sock. You're going to want a merino sock, maybe a synthetic sock. If it's really cold, you could always go for the warm and safe electric socks, but they're a bit of a faff. 
in that they only really work, they only really make sense if the socks connect into the pants and the pants then connect into the jacket. So basically you've got a complete electric outfit. In truth, if the thing that's putting you off commuting is getting cold feet, it may be that just commuting is not for you. So that's it, that's our take on how choosing the right clothing can make a difference to your winter commute. It can make the winter commute much more bearable. Now, if you saw Sean's recent video on hints and tips, you'll also have seen that one of the things he came up with was making sure before you leave in the morning that you've left your gear on a radiator because if you put it on and it's warm, it doesn't have to take your body's heat to warm it up. So that's a great tip. You can also carry, I think we've mentioned this already, make sure you always carry a waterproof with you it can help if it's raining, especially if you've got a drop liner jacket, but even if it's cold, it's another windproof layer that can make the body's temperature much warmer. Now, in terms of high vis, something we haven't discussed, then I think there's a case in winter commuting to always wear either a high vis waterproof jacket. So for example, the Scott one comes in a yellow or to wear a yellow vest. I've left the last subject, the most controversial subject, to last, and it's airbag vests. Now, one cannot argue against the airbag vests. In certain circumstances, they can save your life. But I have to say that personally, I'm not, from the airbag vest that I've seen out there, I'm not a complete convert. In hot weather and during the summer, I think they're gonna impede airflow and I think they could be a hindrance because they're gonna stop you, they're gonna stop your body from cooling down. I would not wear one personally in the summer. On the track, yes, I can see they have a roll there, but a little bit like a one-piece leather suit. My fear is that a, an airbag vest can create a sense of invulnerability on the bike, and I think that could be dangerous. But I have to say that if I was commuting, if I had a long commute through the winter, and I wanted to edge things just a little bit in my favor, I would certainly be tempted to wear an airbag vest. Perhaps not in the summer, but during the winter, why not? Anyway, this has been Chris, the chap in the cap. I hope you found some interesting pointers from this little video. And if you've only picked up a couple, then as far as we're concerned, it's been worthwhile.